Ignite your curiosity with Austin next. We're watching Austin transform from a thriving ecosystem into a global superstar. With our host, Jason Scharf, we aspire to better comprehend the true nature of innovation. Together, we will uncover what makes a successful ecosystem and navigate the technologies shaping our future. Now let's dive into what's next. Today's podcast is sponsored by Austin Private Wealth, a registered investment advisor focused on fee-only financial planning and investment management. Their mission is to serve affluent clients with personalized financial advice, fostering a trusted relationship that will endure for generations to come. Austin Private Wealth is not just about managing wealth. They're about inspiring you to embrace a future filled with possibilities and helping you architect enduring legacies. Their core values of integrity, service, caring, excellence, and growth are at the heart of everything they do. Connect with them today at austinprivatewealth.com. Austin Private Wealth is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Austin Private Wealth and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. No advice may be rendered by Austin Private Wealth unless a client service agreement is in place. Investing involves risk and possible loss of principal capital. Please seek advice from a licensed professional. Gary Hoover is one of the Austin originals when it comes to the innovation scene, as well as one of the first people that I spoke to when starting up the Austin Next podcast. Welcome, Gary. How's it going today? It's going good. How about you, Michael? Doing well. That's good. How long ago did we did you start the uh, Austin Next podcast? Well, the Austin Next podcast was started in July of 2021, so just 18 months okay. ago. And you and I spoke, I think, in April or May to try uh-huh. to get some ideas about who to talk to first and that kind of thing. And I, much appreciated. Good. Yeah. So let's start with the bad news. I mean, in October, you lost your house to fire. And uh, yes. I'm guessing a, a whole Your bunch library. of your, your huge business book library. How's the recovery going? Oh, well, I'm in a new home. I'm up near Tyler, Texas, in a town called White House. And I've begun to buy a few books, but a long way from the uh, 70,000 books that I had. But thanks to all the people that helped on the GoFundMe account and everything else, I've been able to uh, get restarted. Great. If anybody wants to donate, tell people where they can go and uh, find your GoFundMe page. Well, if you just Google GoFundMe Gary Hoover, it'll pop right up, you know. I don't have the, the full URL right at my fingertips, uh, the web address, but if you go fund me or go into GoFundMe and search on my name, it'll come right up. Great. I would encourage that. So let's see, you've started multiple companies. You've been around yep. for a while. You've done a couple of those. And obviously you have a great love for books because one of those companies was Bookstar. Yeah. As well as a company, you know, a phone uh, named after yourself, Hoover's, which gave a lot of data that I used when I was an investment banker looking up. Uh, well, that's good. Uh, we, and... I actually, we didn't name it after myself originally. It was called the Reference Press. And then, but to have best copyright protection and trademark protection, our first book was called Hoover's Handbook, Guide to American Companies. Uh, guide, uh, companies all over the world, right? Yeah. And then we broke it into world and American book. But that became popular. Uh, a friend of mine took over the company, a uh, college buddy, and created Hoover's.com. So Hoover's became the brand. So after I was no longer uh, a CEO, but I was still on the board, uh, the board voted to rename it Hoover's. But a little background there. I yeah. have yet to name a company after myself when I started it. <laughs> all right. So, okay. You've started companies, you've exited companies. You've taught about the entrepreneurial uh, uh, process and the entrepreneurial situation. Yeah. If you had to distill it down, could you give me two or three good lessons for entrepreneurs and innovators today? Boy, there are so many. Where does one begin? You know, I, I, I believe all success really starts with being curious, uh, really being interested in a lot of things, asking a lot of questions, asking the right questions. Studying, reading a lot of books, I figured uh, that massive library I had, probably 70% of the material was not online anywhere. People tend to think, well, all the answers are online. But, you know, the, the greatest books, most of them are still under copyright. They haven't been, uh, you know, Google uh, uh, digitized yet. Uh, a lot of the older ones have. And on our American Business History website, we've got over 500 free books you can download that I've gathered off the web that have been digitized. 
But you take something like Peter Drucker, who really was the greatest business thinker ever, or at least the greatest who was not a practitioner. He never built a business. But I think he understood economics, sociology, business, society, and how it all fits together better than anybody. And uh, I recently wrote an article, I'll be blasting it out, uh, for the Archbridge Institute about the lessons of Peter Drucker. So especially study Peter Drucker, his great book, Management, the, the key book from like the 1970s is the one I've used in courses I've taught. Man, there's so many elements. I, I really I don't perceive entrepreneurship as part of business. I call it entrepreneurial thinking. So it's really a mindset, a view of the world. And I think we badly need it in government. We need it in the hospitals. We need it in universities. We need it in museums, you know. And I've, I've kind of fought back at, at the idea that it should always be in the business school. Because at some level, this may sound a little weird, but at some level, it's not about money. And it's about business. But that's a very broad concept. Uh, I see so many people when I teach at the University of Texas in Austin and all colleges all over the world, really. And so often I see, well, the reason I'm going into business is to get rich. And yet, if you study the greatest and most successful entrepreneurs of all time, that's very rarely uh, their top goal. Now, everybody likes money. And, you know, say, would you like to be rich? Uh, virtually everybody says yes. But I've met a lot of sad rich people. I, I had some money at one point and broke a lot. So I've seen both sides. But the reality is finding the some need of society. It may be a un, some unmet need. Now, society may not realize they need it. Nobody was walking around saying, we can't live without Federal Express. We can't live without microcomputers. We can't live without iPhones. We can't live without giant bookstores, you know? Uh, we can't live without rocket ships that back down from space like uh, Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX. So some of them, you know, Henry Ford uh, supposedly said something like, if I'd given people what they wanted, I would have given them a faster horse, you know. So people don't always know what they want. But still, if you can find now other things, you know, if you have a cure for the common cold or something, well, that's pretty obvious. And people want it and need it. And we don't have to talk much more about it. We've really got that cure. But the thing is, finding a vacancy in the marketplace, finding a gap, finding that need or want or desire, I don't care what you call it, that all gets very blurred, those terms. And and then finding a way to fulfill it. Or or, you know, building a better mousetrap, obviously. I was watching Shark Tank the other night and they were talking about how, well, it usually comes down to building a better mousetrap. And if you just watch that show, you see all these crazy inventions. And there was one the other night and I said, Oh, they're not they're not nobody's gonna buy that. And then when the sharks ask them, well, what are your sales? Oh, we've done $5 million in a year. You know? and I'm like, well, I guess I didn't understand that market. Yeah, um, it's funny that you talk about uh, building a better mousetrap and solving a problem. There have been a lot of people writing lately about the uh, levels of innovation and how innovation has changed and how we're not seeing the kind of breakthrough innovations that we saw 50 years ago, let's say, with the microchip and the internet and the like, but we're seeing a lot more incremental innovations. Any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, I think it's BS. Okay. <laughs> it has a gut reaction. No, I mean, when you take the long look at time, you know, history is my uh, one of my many obsessions. But when you look at things over time, yeah, they come in waves. You know, the steam engine came along, you know, and then electricity came along and with it, the telephone but when I look at it, we're we're still really buried in electricity. You know, we are still working off of Thomas Edison and and his competitors, you know, Tesla and Westinghouse, who actually were more successful in the battle between the current wars, between AC and DC and all that. But no, these things come away. We are still pretty early in the internet evolution. You know, I, I made speeches 20 years ago and I said, look, most of the great Internet companies haven't been founded yet. And everybody laughed at me because they said, well, how could you take on MySpace? How could you take on Yacht? How will anyone ever reach the pinnacle that AOL is at? Well, you know, then we got the next generation and now we'll have another generation. Um, Elon Musk is just beginning on all his many journeys. You know, I hope they're all successful. The odds of them all being successful are not high, but 
Uh, I would never bet against that guy. No, and, and the other thing, too, is, uh, you know, read Peter, Peter Diamandis books and stuff like that. And what's going to take place in the health and the medical realms? Uh, you know, I don't know whether it's engineered DNA. And, you know, some of it's very scary, you know, medical ethics and the morals and all that kind of jazz. But a lot of it uh, is very promising. And, guys, we may be able to cure a whole lot more diseases. So, you know, the world is not just about, AI and computers, you know, <laughs> and it's a big world out there. There's a lot going on, uh, medical science, you know, of course, transportation. I mean, if you think about it, and we can debate timing, but in X years, I don't know if it's 10 or if it's 40, but in X years, you know, the cars are going to be autonomous. They're all going to be talking to each other. Everybody, when the stoplight turns green, all the cars are going to move once. The freeways will go faster. There'll be there'll be negatives. There'll be accidents. Uh, there'll be a lot of tests. But no, no, and 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 to predict these evolutions, and it's very difficult to predict the patterns they follow. You know, they may seem obvious, but like I was thinking about the other day, and you know, we've made a pretty big deal over the last maybe thirty years that we've gone wireless. You know, I remember I first saw I forget what Apple called it, but their first I was in a meeting and somebody said, "Look, I can talk to them across the room." You know wirelessly and oh wow what is that and yet if you look at our television system which is still an incredibly important part of people's lives the whole when you include youtube and everything well it was totally wireless you know everybody in america got walter cronkite wireless and then we went yeah. to wired <laughs> and i just wired up to fiber optics so i'm more wired than ever there so uh, fax machines they blew in everybody in america had a thermal paper fax machine and then Nobody had one, you know. And fax machines have been around for ages in corporate offices. They were expensive. They were slow. They had to get special permission to use them. You know, oh, we've got to send a legal document coast to coast. Well, go down to that room where they got that fancy machine. So, you know, it's just hard to predict. The, the key thing is that people be innovative and be out working on your passions and, and what you believe in. And, I mean, I'll... All the talk, because uh, what are you going to do? Like, if you, if you say have that cure for the common cold, but then you read an article and say, oh, big innovations aren't happening anymore, then you like go back to bed and say, well, I'm not going to bother. No, no. No, not at all. March on ahead and make it happen. It's interesting you talk about um, autonomous vehicles, one of the examples you gave. My last corporate job was working for a little company called TRW. And yes. it was interesting because I worked on the, the credit side. In operation. We were down the block from, you know, the space and defense folks. And they always used to come to us when they wanted some of the dumber folks to look at their stuff and tell them if they were making sense out of this stuff kind of thing. And this is back probably 92, 93. They brought us a system for autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. Now, so this is 30 years ago, right? But here's the difference. All of the smarts for these autonomous vehicles were in the roadway. It was all, you know, massive computer systems and, you know, linked to every vehicle via wires in the roadway. And they looked like slot machine cars with their little <laughs> brushes going along. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Now, when you talk to anybody that's looking at autonomous vehicles, it's all machine yeah. language and AI in the car. So although we haven't had those autonomous vehicles yet, I'm still waiting to take my first trip on that new GM financed AI based uh, ride sharing system. Haven't gotten my credentials yet for that, but I will okay. I signed up for it. I, you know how it goes. I will. I grew up in the General Motors factory town, so I'm always rooting for them, but they've needed a lot of rooting for over the last <laughs> Yeah, when I grew up there was a, a Chevy plant down the road from where I lived and they made uh, Corvettes. So we were always oh. You know, all my friends, we were always just drooling over the things coming off of the... Uh... You go to, if you haven't, go to Bowling Green, Kentucky, where they have a Corvette Museum and a Corvette factory. You can order one off the line there and take them. Yeah. Yeah. No, watch it's them, amazing. Watch them I've been there twice. Yeah. Hey, you're teaching at, U at UT. Off and on. I guess lecture now. I was there full time as entrepreneur in residence like 10, 12 years ago. Okay. But uh, uh, yeah, that's some of the professors have used my books and I guess lecture, you know, whenever I'm called, yeah. I answer. So what you, what's your favorite lectures when you lecture? 
my favorite yeah. that I give. Oh, well, I give one about the basics. It's how I call it my standard talk. I think I've given it over a thousand times in like 30 countries, 30 states. <laughs> so it's really, I call it the eight keys to uh, success, eight keys to building and leading successful enterprises. And it's really about being curious, about studying history, about understanding geography, really understanding the world around you and using that to come up with great ideas and developing a vision or a mission. I use words interchangeable. Let's see if I remember them all. It needs to be clear vision. It needs to be consistent. It needs to serve others, which is the most important one, make somebody's life better. And it needs to be unique. And that a lot goes with that. You know, I, I, years ago, I was on the board of directors of Whole Foods Market. And, you know, it's one of the most unique companies in America. And a lot of very eccentric things they did. Their pay structure, their executives were paid a lot less than people in, in the uh, grocery store industry and so on. But each enterprise is unique and, and has its own rhythm. Often it flows from the founder, certainly at the startup level and everything. Those eccentricities are things. But, you know, and, and over time it, it builds its culture and, and has its whole kind of mindset and you know like two of the companies that i most admired over the years were whole foods and southwest airlines southwest has really had a huge bump in the road recently but let's go back a few years when it was on the cover of all the magazines as a great company which it it was and, and probably still is you know when you have these kind of big problems you've got to wait and see what happens but both those companies are pretty eccentric and i, I met people actually who didn't like working for them they were both mm-hmm. companies who were famous as great places to work. And yet I remember running into a guy who worked at Whole Foods and said, ah, I just couldn't stand that whole culture. And they want to tell you how to eat or, you know, there's the only person I ever met that hated working at Whole Foods. I'm sure there are a few others. You got like 50, 100,000 employees like they have now. But uh, in Southwest Airlines, I met one person out of about 200 that I met that had worked at Southwest that didn't like it. So, you know, you got to find the right thing. I remember reading about Intel, you know, phenomenal company, long term, much achieved. And, but that it's just a brutal environment, the, the intensity of having to get stuff right. done on time and beat the competition and just brutal. Well, if you look into it, you know, people either loved it or hated it. The ones that hated it left, well, the ones that loved it, they came in the head. You know? And that's true of everything. And, and I think that's true of every field. I remember I was looking, think about becoming a stockbroker because I followed the stock market since I was a little kid. But I thought, well, I really love to travel too much. I don't want to be anchored to a desk, so I never really pursued it. But when I looked into it and I asked, well, what, you know, like, what's it pay to start? Well, I talked to one of the biggest brokerage firms. They said, well, you name, you name the number, whatever you need. And I'm like, well, and I said, and then uh, within two years, if you aren't making enough commissions to cover it, you're, you know, time to find another profession. So they, they help you get started. But I'm thinking, you know, 70% of the people that take them up on that probably drop out in three years. I don't think you're wrong about that, but I do want a statement about depression. 30% or whatever percent become multimillionaires. They say, well, look at all the people at their first job splitting burgers at McDonald's. And then that one-tenth of one percent of them that love it and go on to own McDonald's. So you just got to find the right spot. You got to find where it's something that you love. Passions can be dangerous because I met people had a business idea. Oh, this is the most important thing in the world. I've made a new bed for my cat that's going to change the world, you know. And, and I'm like, well, maybe you're more passionate about this than everybody else. But you don't know until you try. Like that's the it. Chart yeah. I could be wrong. There could be 50 million people that want your silly cat bed or whatever. But there you go, Gary. Great talking to you. Look forward to talking to you again soon. Always have best. your people check out AmericanBusinessHistory.org because a historic perspective is so important. And that's right. my main passion and effort these days, AmericanBusinessHistory.org. And like you said, passion's a great thing. There hey, you go. gotta have it. Gary yeah, Michael, thank you very much. Appreciate Thanks so much. You have a great day. Adios. So what's next, Austin? We're glad you've joined us on this journey. Please subscribe at your favorite podcast catcher. Leave us a review and let your colleagues know about us. This will help us grow the podcast and continue bringing you unique interviews and insights. Thanks again for listening and see you soon.